and I impair engagement. Oops, we're good. there's our recording. We, we are recording this because we know that some student athletes weren't able to make it tonight. So, so just wanted to let you know, um, it's not something that we really, you know, we'll be putting out there uh, for, for certainly not for the general public, but it's more for our own use and for other students who weren't able to participate. Again, I'm Robin Ward. I'm executive director of alumni and parent engagement at Bryant. Uh, we've been doing these Bulldog Connection programs uh, as Amanda, whom you'll meet in a second, our moderator tonight. We've been doing them for about 10 years, and but they've always been in person. And they've been on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And, you know, everybody kind of trudges in and gets coffee. And, and, and we've had all kinds of panelists from all different fields. And it's, it's been very general. So what we decided to do this year was make it more specific. So here we've got, we've got lots of people interested in the health sciences who are athletes. And so we've got two fantastic panelists for you today. Um, so that was what we were allowed, this, this virtual format allowed us to really uh, test some things. So we really want your feedback afterwards. Did this work for you? Was it comfortable? Were you able to get your questions answered? Um, so during the one hour program, feel free to write your questions in the chat feature. Um, and if there's time, we'll unmute people and let you ask questions directly. Don't forget, um, I, I believe that both our panelists uh, are on are, are probably in LinkedIn, um, as all of you should be. Colby, Lauren, I hope so. Um, I think everybody, you're going to want to connect with them. Uh, on LinkedIn and in other ways, they, they may be willing to connect with you directly. Um, so that, you know, those are, those are sort of the ground rules. There really aren't any. Uh, it, it'll be a fantastic session. Uh, you're going to be led today by a senior, Amanda Whittem. Many of you know her, obviously. And, uh, and uh, so for, I'm going to let you take it over, Amanda, to, to briefly introduce Colby and Lauren, and they'll also introduce themselves and talk about what they're doing and and we've got some, some questions. So I'm gonna leave you now and we'll turn it over to you, Amanda. Awesome, Robin. Well, thank you so much for that introduction and thank you to our two outstanding alumni with us tonight. Um, all right, and first up, we have Second Lieutenant Colby North, US Air Force, um, here with us tonight, class of 2019. And additionally, we have Lauren Keese, class of 2017, uh, with a doctor in occupational therapy with St. Elizabeth's Hospital, South Shore Orthopedics, and currently working on inpatient and outpatient care. So thank you both so much for being here tonight. And Colby, if you'd like to start a little introduction and then we'll take it over to Lauren. Sure, uh, like Amanda said, I'm Colby. Um, I graduated in 2019. I was a double major in biology and psychology and my minor was management. Um, I played on the softball team with Lauren and um, see a few familiar faces out there. Um, but other than that, my senior year, I started applying to medical school. Um, I got in and I'm currently a second year medical student in the Air Force at Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences, um, which means I am active duty while going to medical school. Um, it's been really fun and I've loved it so far. Um, and I just finished up my classroom portion of medical school and I'm going to go live in Texas for a year in a couple of weeks and start the clinical part in the hospitals. Um, and I also have a short disclaimer. Anything I say here is my personal opinion, my personal views. Um, it does not reflect the opinion or the views of the Department of Defense or the US Air Force, so. Okay, well that introduction was gonna be so much cooler than mine. So I'm Lauren, I graduated in 2017. Like Colby said, we were teammates. I also played on the softball team. Um, after graduation, I went to Mass General Hospital Institute of Health Professions in Massachusetts and got my doctorate in occupational therapy. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's similar to physical therapy, but we take a more holistic, full encompassing approach to care. So we're focused on um, kind of not so much the injury, but how it affects outcomes in daily living and daily life. At Bryant, I was a psychology major and management minor. And now I work at St. Elizabeth's Hospital on the COVID units, both the general medical floors and the ICU. So that's certainly been interesting as a new grad. Um, I graduated this past May from grad school. 
So that's been a lot to learn. And then I'm also an outpatient. So for occupational therapy, we can also fabricate a bunch of different like orthoses and splints and prosthetic devices. So I've been doing that on an outpatient level um, and just kind of continuing to learn as I go. So excited to be here with you guys tonight. That is so awesome. So from teammates to now alumni together in this panel, that is really outstanding. Well, thank you both so much for that brief little intro. And I think we'll kick it off with question number one. Um, so we'll have Colby start. So what skills and competencies have you found most valuable as you've progressed through your career? And what, some of, like, what are some of those competencies you would advocate for the students here with us tonight? Um, so I think definitely the biggest one is flexibility. Um, I think we've all gotten a little too much practice with that this year, but um, just being flexible, even right from the start of my career, um, I'll go into it a little bit later, but I found out I had a week to get down to officer basic training in Alabama. So I basically had to like throw my life in a bag and get down there um, in a week. So just being able to stay flexible with the schedule that we were given during like softball and everything like that really helped me um, to maintain my head during a very crazy time. Um, and then I think additionally, another one we've gotten too good at this year is um, building grit because uh, it's a grind. Grad school, medical school, it's, it's hard, um, but using the skills you have now um, to kind of get through it and uh, keep good spirits the whole way through um, really helped. And I know softball for sure works with a sports psychologist that helped us develop um, like gritty techniques and practices. So I think that really helped. Um, on a more practical level, I think getting involved in research now is a really good idea. If you can, um, reaching out to faculty members and building your research, research skills can be very important and a good thing to talk about in interviews. Yeah, I completely agree. Just echoing off of that, I think it's kind of a cliche, but being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, so being willing to take risks and try new things that initially you might have a different perspective towards, but you won't know unless you try. And then kind of going off of that, just being able to be your own advocate. So if you do have questions or concerns or interests and you're not quite too sure what steps to take or who to reach out to, just really advocating for yourself to make sure that you're putting yourself in a position for success in the long run. All right, awesome. Well, thank you for those responses. It really seems like this common theme of just grit, you know, this independence, also really leaning towards others of just like really enhanced where you are currently. So I think that leads us to question number two. Um, what part of your experience as an athlete or team member resonated most positively with employers and the interview process? Colby, I don't know if you want to start with that or not. <laughs> sure. Um, so it's a little bit different with the military um, because it's all one big team. So I felt like I really graduated from one and went right into another. So a lot of my interview process was focused on teamwork and how I operate within a team. Um, and they were very interested to hear that. Um, and especially military healthcare is one big team. They all say like, it's a small air force, it's a small military. And it really is like our professors all went to school together. They're all practicing together now. Um, so my school very, has, very much has a team-based feel um, in that like my classmates could deliver my children one day and could be operating on me if I need it. So we all want each other to be the best doctors and the best students that we can be right now. Um, so it is a very team-based atmosphere. So it was actually a big part of my interview process here. Yeah, and I would completely agree um, as far as the interview process for grad school, as well as jobs following grad school. The biggest thing that they're going to ask, regardless of being an athlete or not, is kind of leadership. Um, in healthcare, we come across a lot of, even if you're working in research or um direct patient care. Um, they really want to see how well you can ha handle adverse situations. So being able to say, oh, well, in a group of eight to 20 people, I was able to kind of have those difficult conversations and be able to express certain things and have that leadership skill set that easily transfers over to patient care. So even though it might not seem comparable at the time, I would say that 100% of the time I've been asked about leadership qualities and kind of how you can relate that to the position that you're interested in. And that was, again, for a grad school as well as for a job after school. Awesome. And that 
what you just mentioned, like having those really strong empathy and listening skills. And you get a lot of that as we've all established, like just being a really good teammate, you know, outside of athletics too. And especially in the two positions you're in, that like seems like a very important skill. Yeah, exactly. And kind of going off of that, I think that being a member of a team allows, it lends itself to more flexibility in those volunteer roles and in those leadership roles outside of athletics, um, which kind of piggyback off one another. So employers or grad school interviewers or things like that, they're really looking for not only participation in maybe your athletics, but what you did to take it that extra step further outside of things. Awesome. All right. So that leads us to question number three. And also, like I, I just put in the chat, um, I'm going to be posting like the question just as a reminder. And then if you have anything else that comes up, just put it in the chat and we'll be sure to spend plenty of time at the end to address them. So awesome. So question number three, and I think all of our, looks like we have a few seniors in the room as well. Um, so this is a super important one. How did you adjust to life after college athletics? And, you know, maybe touch upon was there a specific like teammate or coach that helped you with that transition after athletics? Um, or maybe if you still play a little softball. Lauren, you want to take this one first? Um, so it was really hard. Um, being a student athlete is kind of our identity from when we first start playing. And our goal is always, you know what, I want to play at the D1 level. I want to play at that high competitive level. And then when that's done, it's kind of like, oh, well, what else is going on? And th so I think a big thing is just kind of harnessing and putting that energy in towards kind of setting that next goal for yourself. Um, so for me, it was staying in touch with teammates, um, kind of having that accountability system where I would check in with them, they would check in with me. Um, this might sound silly, but finding ways to stay physically active and to still have that community feel. So joining a gym that has like the same people that are always going to it are taking the same classes with certain people. Um, just cause that can be really hard to kind of, I don't want to say be stripped of that identity, but kind of fall into a new one. Um, so I would say that the biggest thing is just like that accountability piece. Um, and also finding something else that you can really start to set goals towards and work towards, um, just to give you that like purpose and drive towards the greaterness of whatever you want to be, if that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. I loved how you mentioned, you know, that accountability aspect, um, whether it's like a handful of friends still, you know, in that like group chat and stuff, do you guys usually talk about your like career development or like cool things you're working on um, in addition? Uh, it's a little bit of both, actually, um, just kind of seeing where everyone's at. And then if anyone's stuck in certain areas, um, Brian obviously lends itself to the business school as well as the health and sciences. So if someone's in a rut, kind of brainstorming ways in which to move past that or something as simple as like, hey, let's get together and go for a run or work out, just finding ways to maintain that inclusiveness with each other. Awesome, Lauren. Thank you for sharing that. Colby, up next, you know, playing off of that and how your transition has been a little bit similar or different. Yeah, I definitely echo everything Lauren said. Um, and that support system is going to be a huge part of it. Um, I definitely still keep in touch with teammates also. And it's a little bit of like, hey, here's what's happening in my life. And oh, yeah, I miss playing with you every day and ev everything in between. Um, and then also, I built a good support system here of ex-college athletes um, who actually are mostly older than me. So they were able to kind of help me through that transition. So I found that very helpful. Um, I currently live with a girl who played soccer, a guy who played football. We have an ex-swimmer and another ex-softballer down the street. So we have a good community of people here who um, were kind of able to help me with that transition. And then um, there's also another classmate across the street who will call me up every now and then and say, hey, do you want to go play catch? And we'll just go throw the ball around for a couple hours, you know. So I think finding ways to kind of uh, build a support system around yourself and then stay active with the sport if you want to as well. No, that's, I love the way you described it. It's so important because I know a lot of us, whether we're seniors or even as freshmen, it's something that, you know, you always are thinking about. And especially with the you know, current conditions with covid not really having that complete certainty of when our next competition is going to be. Do you think you could provide the panelists with maybe a little advice there, how to keep on going through? 
Lauren, if you want to add a little something there. I mean, it's, it's hard. I certainly don't envy the position that you guys are in as student athletes with everything going on, but I think you'll be able to reflect on this time and just acknowledge the resiliency that you did have throughout it. Um, obviously, we know as student athletes, a lot of the prep happens on and off the field or the court. Um, and a lot of that is mental preparation as well. So even though you might not have that instant gratification of, okay, I put in all this work in the off season, let me go show my results and let me go be the best I can be on the field, but kind of that mental training to say, okay, this is my reality right now, but how is this going to impact me in the future? And obviously this pandemic is new for all of us, but it is a skill set that'll help you a lot as you progress into that next level, whether it be grad school or working in some sort of um, medical specialty, um, just kind of being able to say, okay, you know what, if plan A and B don't work out, what is plan C through Z? Kind of having that next step in mind um, to mentally make yourself a little bit more resilient and tough. But again, it's definitely not an easy thing. And I give you guys a lot of credit for sticking with it. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. It's definitely like uplifting hearing that. Um, I know, like I said, a lot of first years who haven't even had a first season yet and, you know, praying that comes soon. Uh, but Nicole, would you like kind of to add on to that? Truthfully, I don't have a lot to add. I think Lauren really hit it on the head there that um, I know what kept me going when it was off season, which seems so long. So I can't even imagine how this has been, was just looking forward to like the day we finally get to take the field. So just keep that in mind and you're working towards that goal. And I think Lauren had it right that this mindset and this goal driven um, way of thinking is really going to help you in the future. Yeah. And just kind of like piggybacking off of that, as hard as things are now, you really are setting yourself up for success. You're living in such a like tumultuous time period. And to be able to say, oh, I was a student athlete. I continued my studies. I continued to train and I got a degree from a great school. And now this is what I'm pursuing. That's just going to make you an even better candidate for whatever you're choosing to do, knowing that you positively got through this difficult time. That was truly wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I think I can see some faces around a little bit like of hope going around. Um, and it's definitely something like we face every day, just adversities that never knowing what's going to happen next. And that's a common theme in athletics. But now we're applying that even larger to like life in itself right now. So thank you for sharing that. And then lastly, um, our final question, kind of everyone's favorite question, but what is one piece of advice that you wish someone had told you, um, you know, before at our age? Um, I'll start. So it might seem a little silly, um, but for me, mentorship, leadership, kind of having someone that I can look up to has always been huge for me. And when I was in college and looking to play at the collegiate level, I always had someone to look up to, whether it be a coach or an athlete or a senior, and then you graduate and you're kind of back at square one. Um, so my biggest piece of advice is just network, get out there, send as many emails as you want, kind of make your face and name known um, and have someone take you under your wing. I know even now at work, um, I'm always looking for someone to mentor me or always looking for someone to kind of lead me and guide me because we obviously won't always know everything. So it's really important to have that support system, but in a productive way. Um, so I would say just allow yourself to find that mentorship and really just, again, it goes kind of back to that self-advocacy piece. You're your biggest advocate. Make sure that you're looking for someone who can support you along the way. And then I'm also, I know we still have a while ago, but I'm going to leave my email in the chat please reach out with any questions. I know when I would go to these, um, I wouldn't really think much of it. And then as soon as we'd leave, I'd be like, oh, shoot, I should have asked that. Or this person's interested in that. Um, I know Colby and I's career paths are pretty specific, um, but we do have a good understanding as far as research, um, other medical initiatives or places that you want to go. Um, so feel free to reach out. Awesome. So I so love that. And then Cole, if you want to kind of segue right there. 
Um, so I have two pieces because one is very, very practical. Um, just if you're thinking about med school and, and this might apply to other um, grad schools as well, but I just know from my experience um, with medical school, apply early. Um, I thought that it was kind of like college, you know, where you have like the whole time to get your application in and then they start admitting people. That is not the case. Um, so pretty much when they say you can submit, you should be ready to push the button. Um, and that kind of got me in a sticky situation, like I said earlier, where I found out I got in the first week of June and I had to be down in at Maxwell Air Force Base the second week of June. Um, so I could have saved myself a lot of worry, a lot of waiting um, by applying earlier. So that's definitely a big piece of advice I wish someone had told me. And then um, kind of echoing Lauren's networking is super important. And I think just generally taking advantage of opportunities that you have now um, even if you don't necessarily think that you're qualified for them. Um, I know my freshman year, I just applied a little bit on a whim uh, for a summer research fellowship. And I ended up in a biochemistry lab at Brown University. And I felt so like in the deep end, not prepared. I didn't feel like I fit in at all, but I learned so much. I met so like such great people that I'm still in contact with. Uh, and we published a paper out of it, which was really helpful when I was applying to medical school. So even if you don't think you're quite ready or quite qualified, like there's no harm in applying, there's no harm for trying to take advantage of all these opportunities that you have now. That was really well said. It's kind of like the, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And I think that's so applicable here because a lot of times you're like, you really think about it, you really think about it, but you know, you just have to go out and do it. Um, and then just to kind of circle back, um, Lauren, who was maybe like one like mentor you had kind of helping decide your major and then therefore help you with your first career like job and position? Yeah, so I actually, my mentor ha was not in the field at all. Um, I used to do work with children who have autism. And so one of the kiddos moms that I would work with, his mother was like my whole inspiration for going into occupational therapy. Um, so it kind of snowballed off of that, reaching out to her connections and finding ways to connect there, looking into programs that I was interested in and applying. Um, a big part of getting your doctorate, there's a big research base, um, especially for the field of OT. It's kind of lacking a lot of that empirical evidence. So connecting with one of my faculty and kind of using them as a sounding board, whether it be frustrations with the program or questions about next steps, just really being able to connect with someone along the way. So it doesn't necessarily have to be one person throughout your whole journey or your whole adventure but just kind of finding those people along the way so you never feel stagnant or stuck. Awesome. And then really that's, it's really important. Like things like we always said, things just shift and move around so much and being really adapt to that. Like, it's okay. It's like, it's something, that we, especially like being seniors, a lot of us have like come to realize like, hey, it's okay. It's all part of the process. Um, Colby, touching back on that, who was maybe one mentor who helped you really develop yourself at academically at Bryant? At Bryant, there's almost too many to name. Um, I know Dr. Trenzo really helped me figure out my life um, when I knew I was going to medical school, but I took a psych class and really loved it. So I know I went to him and he sat me down. He's like, well, you know, a psychiatrist is a medical doctor, right? It's like, oh, maybe I want to be that then, you know, and um, so he really sat me down and helped me. Um, Dr. Hokeness really helped me with the whole medical school application. Um, Dr. McAuliffe in psych was amazing. Dr. DeLuga, um, Dr. Reed really helped me get some op like some research opportunities. Um, Dr. Boslow helped me get some uh, shadowing experience at an ER. Like it, the community at Bryant was unreal um, in helping me achieve my goal. Uh, I couldn't have asked for anything better um, from the faculty there. And Coach Nick, honestly, our softball coach um, was a great person to look up to during this whole time. Um, and just the way he was flexible in allowing me to apply and go and interview in the middle of preseason. And um, he was great the whole time. So uh, there's almost too many to name and it was a good place to find people, good community. Yeah, I think, I mean, Colby's making a great point. The resources are there. It's just a matter of reaching out and finding them. And that really starts by just asking the question, asking anyone and they can point you in the right direction to kind of get you that mentorship or get you that interview or kind of help get your foot in the door for the next place. 
That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I think a big challenge this year, especially being hybrid on campus, was the fact there were no walk-in office hours. So how might you suggest students reaching out to all these awesome faculty and mentors you just named? Um, I think email is a good tool, um, social distance. And I think honestly, um, I've done this to a couple of people at, in school here. It's just reaching out um, like, hey, do you have a few minutes after this Zoom call? And staying on to talk to them. And that's almost as good as face-to-face, -face, you know? Awesome. And then Lauren, if you kind of want to echo that or anything, I know we've been, everyone's been like on social, like crazy. I know it's something that I myself have learned better at, but did you say like LinkedIn or any other tools like that, that you started your junior, senior year for outreach or? Uh, I was just, I'm that person that's like super annoying with emails. So if I don't hear back from you in the standard, like 72 hours, then I'm sending you another email. I'm just kind of, being a bit tenacious and trying to get someone to talk to you. Um, I think LinkedIn is great. I must admit, I have not updated it in a while. So I apologize. Um, but yes, just using that and then using your own network of people that you have to kind of reach out to others. Um, so for example, like Colby, we took a couple classes in undergrad together and she was more involved in like the bioscience end of things. And if I ever had a question, she could kind of lead me in the direction of which professor to reach out to or how to go about tackling a certain thing. Um, so networking doesn't necessarily have to be with people outside of your circle. Um, you can just kind of open up that conversation. Yes, I think peer mentorship, peer networking, whatever you want to call it is huge. Um, I know here there's several people who uh, have told me really important resources to use and have like sent me the best links to stuff. and um, just making connections like that and um, asking for help when you need it truthfully. Um, because when I came in, I had no idea what resources were the best and um, even like how to do a study schedule because you know we always kind of have it laid out for us since we have class from eight to 12 and then lift from one to two and practice from three to five, you know, it's all kind of laid out for us. So um, I had friends here who really helped me kind of establish a good study schedule here. Exactly. Kind of learning through people who have gone through the process before. Um, so that's why I'm obviously speaking for both Colby and I, um, but it is a difficult transition to make in the sense that you have this one way of doing time management and that kind of flip flops a little bit. Um, so definitely use us as resources or assistance for anything. That's so awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think on that note, we're going to transition and ask the audience for some questions. So you can put your any like questions right in the chat. Um, and or you can, if you feel feeling like it, we have a small group. So you can definitely just like ask out. Uh, like you heard Colby and Lauren said, they're, they're really spending this time with you to really help fellow Bulldogs and, you know, just keep that that cycle of helping and you know, sport like all going around. So feel free, ask out, you can send it in the chat. Um, but yeah, the time, the time is all yours. So ask those questions in the chat. Yeah, feel free to ask whatever. And then I'm curious what people are interested in since it is a smaller group. Um, even if maybe what we're saying isn't necessarily pertaining to you, we could again, lead you in the right direction. So definitely let us know what you're interested in pursuing after your time at Bryant. I have a question. Yes. Um, what made you guys choose Bryant um, as like your school? Because obviously if you're going into like the medical field, I kind of know Bryant more as like a business oriented school. So like why, why did you guys choose Bryant and how did that end up helping you? Yes. So to be very transparent, um, softball and the scholarship that came along with it was a big determining factor in going to Bryant and then kind of looking at my options as far as knowing I wanted to pursue, pursue a um, post-professional degree. Um, I figured that business is applicable anywhere. And so having to have both that business and the health sciences aspect, um, again, was huge throughout the interview process. Um, having it, someone who wants to go into the medical field, but also having a business background is very rare. Um, 
And so that was like a super, super helpful additional add-on to have there. Yeah, same yeah. for me. Thank uh, you. It was definitely softball that drew me over. Um, but once I got here, I or at Bryant, I really liked the small community feel of it. Um, and I realized that I could build a good network and a good community here to really help me succeed. Thank you. Well, thank you, Keegan. First question of the night. We appreciate it. Um, sorry, that was like super OL of me to say it like that. Um, so for another question we have in the chat uh, from Emma, how would you recommend getting hours for PA school slash medical school? So I got clinical hours for medical school by shadowing, but I don't think that counts for PA school. I could be wrong there. Um, so that's how I got most of my hours. Um, but I know quite a few people at my school who have uh, been EMT certified and they ran EMT calls for a while. Um, we have a couple people or quite a few people who scribed, um, who are medical scribes and then a couple of medical assistants, I believe too. Um, so those are all valid options. And then I know a girl from my class, she played basketball at Bryant. Um, she um, was initially an EMT and she was actually able to do that over the weekend um, to get her hours. So even the, just the training courses count towards that observation, but Colby's right, PA is a little bit different. Great, well, thank you for that. We're gonna head to another question from the chat from Logan. When did you find yourself prepared slash ready enough to take the MCAT? Any specific class that made you feel prepared? I will be very frank. Um, I'm a terrible person to ask about the MCAT. I took it twice, did not study either time. Um, somehow ended up with a good enough uh, score to get in. Um, but I've asked my friends because I'm trying to help another couple people from Bryant uh, get in. So um, really a lot of chemistry helped, um, the basic bio class helped, um, I got a couple of the MCAT prep books that you can get off online, um, didn't use them, but they're supposed to help, um, and yeah, I think just really taking, like, the foundations in science was probably the best way to go about that, and then, um, sociology really helped me because there's a section on sociology and, um, psychology, so if you can take uh, a couple basic psych classes. I think developmental psych really helped me. And um, I wanna say just like psych 101, like basic psych helped as well. Awesome note there. Thank you, Colby. And Lauren, would you wanna add on to that a little bit about preparation for the um, MCAT? Um, yeah, so I didn't have to take the MCAT, thank goodness. I had to take um, uh, something called the NBCOT, which is just like the national licensure exam. Um, again, it's just kind of finding that time management and um, that group of support to kind of work through it together. I definitely couldn't have done it without my peers and my classmates. Awesome. And another question for you, Lauren, from Tyler. What made you choose OT over PT? I love this question. So um, I kind of went back and forth. I think that PT is wonderful. I have a lot of PT friends and they're very interconnected, especially in the hospital setting that I'm at. Um, but OT kind of gives you that flexibility to do what you want with it. Um, there's a heavy focus on cognition and mental health, which you don't really see in PT. Um, and then you just kind of have the overarching as aspect of just the full picture of looking at the human. So I give the reference PT, if you tear your ACL, you're gonna go do some exercises, get your strength back, get back into what you're doing. OT, I picture the example as someone had some trauma, some significant trauma, and they have a spinal cord injury. And so you're kind of meeting them where they're at, teaching them the basic life skills. How do they get themselves dressed? How do they kind of manage not only their physical, but their mental health? Um, and that's just a big piece in helping them to be as independent as possible moving forward. So it's just more person centered in a way that you're looking at head to toe, all the different things that could be impacting their current condition. And I'm, I love talking about it, obviously. So any questions about OT, <laughs> I'm here. I love that. I can really just see the excitement, both of you, when you're talking about it. And I think that's something all of us are really trying to achieve. So just seeing that connection and like that response, that's something we're all really like striving for. So it's so awesome to hear. 
Um, and then another question from Jordan. Um, hey, Jordan. Anyway, um, so uh, Cole, if you want to start off. So the question is, do you think there's a good number of programs to apply to post undergrad? Or would you focus on putting together just a couple of applications? Yeah, um, I'm going to echo Amanda. Hey, Jordan. <laughs> and med school, there's like a common app like there is for college. So you can kind of cast a wide, as wide of a net as is financially feasible, basically, um, because you just submit one application, one personal statement, like three letters of recommendation, and then you just click the button. And it is very expensive. Um, but then from there, they will send you back a secondary application if they're interested, which most schools are because they can get money from you. Um, so from there, they will send you back a secondary application. And that's kind of where you start paring down things um, because I'm pretty sure the first one, unless it's changed, the first round of applications is like $40 per school. And then secondaries are anywhere from like 80 to $120 per school. Um, so that's where cost really comes in. Um, and you apply from there. So I think I applied to around 20 schools um, for, for primaries. And then for secondaries, I think I sent in eight to 10 applications um, and then went from there. Unless uh, my school, the application is free. So that was nice. Um, and it was my number one choice. So at the end of it, I kind of looked back and I was like, oh, I spent all this money, but I got it. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> awesome. Congratulations. I love, like you said, just seeing that excitement there and all these little points are so, you know, the things you don't just like learn from, oh, reading the textbook or doing the coursework. So this is just so valuable for all of our students here. Um, Lauren, would you like to add on to that as well? Yeah, there's not some like magic number that you need to apply to a, this amount to get in. I have plenty of friends who applied to one school, got in, and that's where they've been. Um, like Colby said, it's very expensive. So a big thing that I looked at first was where do I want to be? Um, I was kind of toggling back and forth between staying in Massachusetts and going out of state. Um, and then kind of looking a little bit deeper into the programs I was applying to to see if they would offer kind of specifically what I was looking for as far as travel opportunities or jobs at, after graduation, graduation rate. Um, so not kind of willy nilly applying, but making sure I was a little bit more succinct with it. I think I applied to 12 schools in total. Um, and it's nice because even if you do hear more back from those secondary lists, um, you're getting that exposure and that interview experience, um, which really helps you for when you do have the interview that you really want. <laughs> Very cool. And would you say you had the same or similar mentors um, or professors to help you like guide through this process? Yeah, so um, Professor Hokeness and Professor McAuliffe from Psych really, really helped me um, through the application process. Um, I know Professor Hokeness like literally set up a pre-med committee for me uh, because to apply to USIS at uh, my school, you needed a pre-medical committee letter to even like get your application read. And I freaked out because we didn't have one. And I called my dad, I was like, my dream is dead. I'm not going to use this. Like, and he was like, no, you went to Bryant for a reason, like call someone. It's like, oh, okay, I could do that. So I called Dr. Hokeness and she literally had a pre-medical committee put together for me in 24 hours. Like it was absolutely ridiculous. So she really helped me throughout the whole process and just kept checking in like, hey, heard anything back yet? And really just kind of kept me focused and going through the whole process because it is long. Yeah, and kind of going off of that, for me, it was Professor Trenzo. Um, typically, when you hear rehab sciences, you automatically think PET, so OT was new for him as well. Um, but just kind of, again, being that sounding board, being someone I can go to to bounce ideas off of or get help editing application papers or kind of looking at my application head to toe, taking time out of his schedule to do that. Um, but again, I was the one, and I don't know if it was the same for you or not, Colby, but asking for that. Um, the professors are there, but they're not going to come to you and approach you. So again, as athletes, we kind of have that drive and initiation. Um, so just let that kind of carry over into your next step. It was definitely very similar for me um, to ask for that because I'm a very naturally introverted person. Um, 
But when I met Dr. Boslo my senior year, I literally had one class with him. It was like an hour long. And um, he said he was an MD. I knew I wanted to be an MD. So I walked up and introduced myself and said, please help me. And he was a great mentor throughout the whole process too. That's awesome. So it seems like Professor Boslo, uh, Professor Hokeness, Trunzo, all amazing faculty to write down and reach out to if you don't know them already. Um, and I think when, when we mentioned drive and initiation, that leads to a question from Alyssa. What do you think set yourself apart from the other applicants to grad slash med school? Yeah, I think it's um, kind of that fine balance between being humble and then also being confident. Obviously, as athletes, we prepare to be confident in what we do, um, but that doesn't always come super naturally or super easily. Um, but a lot of what you've been through, even if it might seem minute, is a huge strength. Just being a part of a team, being able to say that you work with different leadership styles, different types of personalities, X, Y, and Z settings, time management. Um, it really does a lot of the time fall back onto athletics. So I think being able to kind of have tangible examples of, I did this sport, this prepared me for this. Um, so just kind of being able to give those examples and then be confident in doing so. Um, you wouldn't have gotten an interview if you weren't qualified. Um, so just remember that when you go in, they're not just kind of handing them out willy nilly. You're there for a reason. Um, just like you were at Bryant for a reason. It's the same thing, just on a different, different field, you know? So um, just keep that in mind. Yeah, I'll definitely echo that as well. Like being a part of a team really allowed me to have some strong talking points and um, it really caught people's eye. Like, oh, you played division one softball. Yeah, let's, let's talk about it, you know? And then um, honestly, having some research under my belt really helped in interviews too, because then I could actually talk about what we had been working on. And um, I was very lucky my senior year to kind of happen onto a project that I was really passionate about. So when I started talking about that with interviewers, you know, kind of like Amanda was talking about, they said they could like see it kind of light me up and they knew that, you know, I really enjoyed that part of it. So um, I could potentially be a good candidate in the future. Wonderful. Awesome. And we do have another question in the chat um, from Emma again. Any key tips for interviews kind of going off of what we just said? Um, I think the biggest thing for me when I was first starting to interview is I didn't feel like I was being myself. Um, I would kind of Google generic answers to interview questions or think of ways that I could just kind of put on some sort of front. Um, but the most important thing is being yourself. If you get admitted to grad school or if you get this new job, then you're going to have to be yourself throughout the process. So kind of let that shine through. Um, and then I kind of alluded to it earlier, but just that humble aspect, um, really showing that you're engaged and willing to learn, um, but admitting that you don't know everything, um, which I think is a huge thing, not only for interviews, but for life as well. Um, we're not always going to have the answers. And so it kind of ties everything in together. Um, but just showing that drive and that initiation and willingness to learn is huge. Yes, I definitely agree. And I think something uh, maybe a little more specific to medical school, I don't, I'm not very familiar with any of the other processes, but um, knowing what you're getting into as far as what the interview looks like. So I had an interview that um, was, it was three 45 minute interviews with different people. And then there was like a tour and lunch and whatever. Um, and then I had an interview that was, it's called like the multiple mini interview where you look at a prompt on a door and then you have seven minutes to like talk through the prompt with an interviewer and then a bell dings and you rotate and you do that like nine or 10 times. Uh, so those were very different experiences and I prepared very differently for both of them. Um, so kind of knowing the format that you're walking into is important, I think. Oh, and going off of that, before I forget, like I said, I'm very annoying with the emails. So what I would do is I would look up people in the programs that I was interested in attending and reach out to them through LinkedIn and just kind of ask what their interview process was like. And I know it might sound annoying, but people were very helpful and very receptive because obviously they kind of want to promote the program that they're at. Um, and be responsible for bringing new people in for the interview process. So if you are interested in attending a certain school or applying to a certain job, 
certainly look them up on LinkedIn and it doesn't hurt to reach out. The worst thing that happens is they don't answer and that's okay. And piggybacking off of that, um, it might even be like a formal process at a school that you're interviewing at. I know at mine, we have like a host program. Um, so I'm actually talking with an interviewee like tomorrow night by phone. Uh, normally they would come and stay at the house and, you know, we would go grab dinner and um, kind of chat about school, but it's this, it's very much the same thing, just a formalized process. So you can always ask if they have like a hosting program or something. Awesome. Those are, like I said, these are just like little tidbits of info you don't really come to think so easily. But hearing from two exceptional alumni, it just, it means so much. Um, so it doesn't feel like we have any more questions in the chat so far, but overall, I think we touched on a lot of so, like, so important points. Overall, kind of like transition from college athletics to overall development in your current positions. Um, what do you think maybe is like one more thing each maybe class year can kind of take going into next semester? I think the biggest thing for me, especially at Bryan, and then obviously with the times changing like they are now, is actually set timelines and set goals for yourself that you can see yourself achieve. Um, this kind of goes back to the one piece of advice, but like we said, it's a difficult transition to make from student athlete to just out in the world. So kind of having that next step, setting that goal, whether it be on the field, in the weight room, for your post-professional life, um, I'm going to apply to this many schools by this date, or I'm going to reach out and connect with three people by this date. Just having those tangible goals um, will really help to keep you on track, not only while you're at Bryan still, but then setting you up for the future after as well. Yes, I think that's really important. Um... Also, just I think uh, to, a good thing to keep in mind is to have fun with where you're at right now um, and really enjoy it. Like we, we said earlier, we know it's hard. Um, grad school and med school are hard too, uh, but there's a lot of fun to be found in all of it. So kind of just try to like keep your head up, keep a good like disposition about it and like you'll get through it. Completely agree. Well, thank you both so much for that uplift, uplifting note to finish there. Um, we'll definitely keep it open for like a minute or two if any other questions come in. But um, if Robin wants to make any concluding remarks or anything from you both, that would be great. I don't really have anything more. I was fantastic. I, I, I love the questions. I think the students really covered the bases. Laura and Colby, you both did an incredible job. And I think, you know, again, we had a little bit more time with only two panelists, but I think you covered it all and you really covered the, the broad base. So I had put in there to make sure that we do have a Bulldog Connection group on LinkedIn. Uh, it could be a little bit more active than it is, um, but, and then Lauren and Colby touched on all of the faculty members, by all means, reach out to them. Even though they don't have physical office hours, they're very responsive right now. Um, they're there, you know, absolutely there for you to, to answer questions. So I think this format worked out really well. And I'm looking forward to doing more of these. And, and um, you know, we'll, we'll keep, the other thing that would be helpful to us, I think is as follow-up, if, if there were any areas in, um, in terms of, you know, students who are on, who have biology degrees, or, you know, wanted to go into a research job, wanted to go into pharmaceuticals. If there are other fields and other industries that we didn't catch today, maybe um, I may be able to connect you with some people. They may not be athletes, but we, we may be able to make those connections. So um, by all means, um, I, uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn and it's, um, if you, I've got like three names. So uh, but, but if you just look up Robin Ward, I think you'll find me, but this is the full, uh, nine yards. My son was class of 17. So, um, I'm a parent as well. So, um, look, look, look for me on LinkedIn and connect, and then I'll, um, uh, I'll follow up with you. So great. Amanda, super job as always, Lauren and Colby rock stars. So great. All right softball team was well represented but it's applicable to every single sport exactly and like i said there's no question too big or too small um 
if Colby and I did not address kind of the field that you're interested in, still reach out in grad school and medical school. We mix and match with a lot of different people. Um, so we can definitely lead you in the right direction or at least give you someone else to talk to along the way. Um, but feel free to reach out anytime. Lauren and Colby, I just wanted to say hi. My name is uh, Lily Otu and I'm the Assistant Athletic Director for Inclusive Excellence. I was actually in the HR um, panel, so which started and went a little bit over, so I wasn't here to introduce myself earlier. So I just wanted to say thank you for doing this from the athletic standpoint. And um, I got to hear some of the, the advice and some of the, um, the really, really good um, career wisdom that you both um, embarked on this. So thank you again. Of course, thank you so much for coming. Awesome. Well, huge shout out again to Lily for organizing and helping all of us be informed of all the sessions this week. Um, definitely stay in, in touch, especially for our freshman and sophomore, deciding on your major. There's plenty to come this week. Um, so keep your eyes open for those as well. All right. And hopefully, I mean, the next couple minutes or so, if students hopefully want to stay later, they can ask you some more questions, kind of how like we would be like in person, you yeah. know, after everyone kind of like linger, make their way to the front. So we'll imagine that we're um, in MRC4 right now and we're, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if that sounds good. Yeah, absolutely. Minus the snacks and the drinks. <laughs> In the early morning. Yeah. I, I wish we had the snacks for everybody. Um, so, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to log off, but Meg, if we'll just leave the lines open and it looks like Brian has a quick, a quick question there. So maybe, maybe we'll take it off speaker mode and we can have gallery view for those who stay around. Sounds good. And maybe for the students,